Hey, everybody. Phil slash Polygon here, and you know what? Let's play some Dark Souls 3, man. I thought we would kick off another character building series. Do a little PvE tryst through the game that focuses on standing up a PvP ready tune from scratch. So along the way, we're going to be talking about tips and tricks and strategies for efficiency. We're going to be talking about general impressions of the game. Goods, bads, uglies. We'll touch on lore in the various areas that we traverse. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of tangents to come, and we'll just see where it goes. Okay, man, let's talk about the build a little bit. Set some groundwork. The Clerical Lion. You can probably puzzle out what we're going for from the name. We'll get back to that. But we are, in fact, starting out as a young male cleric who died inexplicably somehow with black firebombs on his person. I took those as my burial gift. We're going to put those to a lot of work down the way. And this is what we look like. Kind of a samurai-looking dude. Old purple-haired samurai just out there floating in the abyss. Spooky. And this build is going to focus on offensive miracles and thrusting weapons. It's kind of a play on the tune that we put together during a purist guide to character building. Gratuitous shout out to that series during the original Dark Souls. That was all about faith and spears. And speaking to miracles for just a moment, I'm not really a big miracle guy. I have no idea why all of these build showcases always seem to feature faith builds. I'm a man of very little faith, and I haven't done a lot of miracling in Dark Souls 3, but I'm very curious about them. I have heard they're slightly underwhelming. I've heard they're maybe a little bit underpowered. So I kind of want to go out there and experiment, boost my faith, grab some gear that ups the potency of miracles, and make up my own mind. Good lord, that was kind of fun and lucky. Frenzied rolling after a missed parry as that dude is throwing a hissy fit with his little broken straight sword there. End it with a BS. I gave him a hurrah for his noble effort. He was trying so hard. Good times afoot in the Cemetery of Ash. Also good times with pokes. So in addition to our library of miracles, I would like to put together a nice little arsenal of thrusters. Thrusting weapons. As I have mentioned many times in the past, I am an absolute sucker for spears. I love the spear weapon class, but I have played through Dark Souls 3 with a spear, and I don't want to rehash that. That's why I can't make a straight clone, or don't want to make a straight clone, of the Faith and Spears character from a purist sky. Instead, we'll branch out into some other thrusting weapons. We'll play around with rapiers a little bit, maybe get some hate mail from the PvP scene. We will pick up some picks. I want a main of war pick. Very curious about that. We're also going to use the Lucerne, which from what I've seen is back with a vengeance. Dark Souls 3. We'll talk a little bit more about the Lucerne down the way when we pick it up towards the end of the episode. Now, I'm just kind of talking over the Cemetery of Ash stuff too, but I do want to point out a couple of quick detours. One for the Titanite Shard. I think most people pick that up. It's a pretty easy jump. We are going to make some out-of-the-way decisions to go grab Titanite Shards. They're pretty few and far between early on, and we do want to upgrade a couple different things. So I want to make sure I snag as many of those as possible. Also wanted to drop down here to grab some fire bombs, man. Fire bombs, in addition to the black ones I took as my burial gift, are going to play a huge role in the plan I have for the high wall of Lothric. More on that to come. But that's about it for the build. High level, at least. We'll definitely dig into the nuts and bolts as we continue to flesh this guy out, pick up some specific pieces of gear that we'll be using. But the long and short of it is that we are a man of the cloth that pokes. Insert dirty joke of choice here. And of course, using all those thrusting weapons, we're going to benefit greatly by the use of a little something called the Leo Ring, which we'll pick up a couple episodes down the way and talk about in depth. Just talking about gear for a second, too, in this run, it is going to be pretty rapid fire. It is assuming some knowledge of the game and is not meant to be a comprehensive first timer's guide to Dark Souls 3. We're focusing on efficiency in character building. Let's take out Gundyr. I struggled with this dude so much the first time I fought him. He proceeded to pick me up, rip off my ass, and hand it right back to me. I thought he was actually a planned death, like the tutorial boss in Demon's Souls or the stray demon in Dark Souls if you take him on before you get your gear. I thought, yeah, there's some trick to it and it'll just warp me past him and I won't get whatever bonus item, but wait, what? Spawn back at the bonfire? I actually have to beat this guy? And I think the thing that made me struggle with him so much is now the thing that I love about him in retrospect. His timing. 
he is a great indoctrination into the way that Dark Souls 3 plays because his timing is so weird. He is built to catch you in panic rolls. Dark Souls 3 is built to punish you for panic rolling. So many bosses have weird little hitches in their swing timings that if you try and panic roll away, you're gonna get popped. So many regular ass PvE enemies have weird little hitches in their swings that'll catch you in rolls. So many PvP encounters come down to who catches the most rolls. <laughs> in my head, I think of Dark Souls 3 as having a little subtitle in the way that you've got Dark Souls 1, Prepare to Die Edition. Dark Souls 2, colon, Scholar of the First Sin. You've got Dark Souls 3, colon, Catcher of the Most Rolls. Which I think is a little weird, because Dark Souls 3, from data I've seen, there's more iframes in the roll, but it definitely doesn't seem like the just roll through it bro kind of roll. Dark Souls 2 was a little bit weird because it was a stat tied to it with adaptability, that's a whole other conversation, but it took me quite a few tries against old Gundyr to finally get the hang of it, and I think he is a great introduction to most of the bosses still to come. You know, kind of forcing you to learn timing and punishing the crap out of you if you panic roll. You need to know when to spam roll to get out of a combo versus when to get hit and take it like a champ and dodge a little bit later. Because otherwise you are going to get smacked. So good work, Gundir. You have served two purposes. One, to vet the chosen undead. Your duty is fulfilled. Which we'll talk about that lore piece a little later. Because we'll meet Gundir again. You also served to teach a valuable lesson. I think it's just the timing. The timing of enemies and their swings will catch you a lot more frequently than in the past. Thanks, Engine. Thanks, PvE, for breaking me of my bad habits right out of the gate. Back to what's going on on screen. So, boilerplating a character. There's a couple items I always pick up on the way to Firelink Shrine. There's an ember guarded by that dog lying in ambush. Those are always handy. I always come out to the back here as well and perform a little spider jump, a little wall jump off that tree to get up on the roof. Now this area is normally accessed by purchasing the tower key from the Shrine Handmaid for a whopping 20,000 souls. That lets you get to the crows, that lets you get a firekeeper soul. You can do a little geometry glitch. Reminds me of a similar thing in Demon's Souls back in 4.1. To access these rafters a little bit early, lets you pick up an Estus Shard a little early, lets you bust through an illusory wall and pick up an incredibly valuable ring early on as well. The Covetous Silver Serpent Ring. We are pretty much going to throw this thing on and wear it for the duration of this playthrough. It boosts soul intake by 10%. I haven't done the math or a side-by-side -side comparison, but it seems to me that in Dark Souls 3, compared to previous titles, levels come a little slower. Having that extra 10% bonus is going to help alleviate that, especially as we're trying to be PvP ready with a single playthrough. So we're off to the high wall of Lothric, and I find this pretty interesting too. It teleports you not to a bonfire. It puts you in this little enclosed room. Why? I think for this, right here. Big cinematic reveal. You're not quite sure of the scope of the world, but then you open those two doors and you see the castle looming in the distance and there's a sunset going on and you say, wow, the world is so marvelous and grandiose, and it is. That's cool. Good work from. Ain't got no time for that right now. We'll admire the view later. But I just thought it was an interesting stylistic choice. Breaking the rule of warping in order to give you a ooh moment. Now when you hit this platform, there's two ways you can go. I always first head slightly in the direction that doesn't lead anywhere to take out that crossbow guy. Remember that we killed him. He could potentially come back to haunt us later. I'll point it out when we get there. But for now, the plan is to make one giant loop through the high wall. Clear out everything that needs clearing out, collect everything that needs collecting, and do all of the advancement stuff in a single pass. Towards the end of that loop, we'll pop out near where that crossbow guy was perched. And as we're trying to take out some dogs and we're trying to take out some larger hollows, that guy could just be pelting us with bolts like a little bitch. Remember that we killed him. We'll kill these lantern guys as quickly as possible too. As I'm sure you know if you've played this before, they've got a little scream that will alert a lot of these sleeping slash lounging hollows to your presence. They'll come at you en masse like an angry football team. Take a little drop, grab some pine resin. Buffs are going to play a big part in the advancement of this build. We'll talk about those and weapon strategies a little bit down the way, but we passed on the binoculars. We passed on the binoculars. Those are fun to have, those are cool to have. Sometimes you come across a vista that just needs peeping. Or you just want to survey the horizon. But as far as efficiency goes, for this build, the binoculars are going to do nothing for us. So instead, we're going to make a run for a weapon that'll suit us significantly better 
than our starting mace, the deep battle axe, housed underneath where this drake perches. Now he'll get up on that tower and just proceed to blanket the entire area in flame. And he doesn't move unless you just sit there and snipe him with God knows how many arrows and he'll fly away. And you get a large shard for it. You don't have any means of doing that at this point. But that first time that he swoops in, it takes him a while to fly over and get situated. That's your best bet to run back into this area. Be careful, because a lot of times those enemies will chase you quicker than his drake fire will catch them. That's why I had my force on there. I thought it'd be kind of funny to troll a little bit, and as those hollows chase me down, I can just force them, just pop them back out into the blazing inferno and let them crisp. If you've got a good shield, that's nice as well but if you get a couple of them in there just trapped in that little alcove they can just start swinging at you in staggered patterns and chew you up just absolutely chew up a starting class character this mimic is the holder of our deep battle axe mimics don't seem to pose a huge amount of threat if you don't open them just be wary of their grab attacks for a low level character for a mid-level character unless you've been pumping vigor it will probably kill you if you get grabbed by a mimic and it's just chomp, chomp, chomping away at your head, you will die. But if you stay close to them, just kind of strafe around them, they seem to have trouble tracking you. And they're not too bad. Even though you're doing shit damage against them, you just kind of chip away. And be patient. And grab your deep battle axe. It's actually just a regular ass battle axe infused with deep. Deep is a darkness elemental weapon. So that thing has okay physical damage and okay dark damage, but no scaling whatsoever. It's flat damage. And so for now, at least, for, for a tiny bit into the future, while we still have our measly starting stats and we're not getting big scaling bonuses anyway, that thing is going to be our best bet for putting out some good numbers offensively. Along the way, we also dispatched our first Lothric Knight. We'll talk about them a little bit down the way, because we run into quite a few more. They can be pretty tricky. But we find ourselves in this area with the second bonfire. Don't want to sit at it. We don't want to respawn any of the enemies that we've killed thus far. Don't want that crossbow guy to come back. We're going to venture out onto the ledge, grab some more fire bombs. We're about to put those to work immediately, and then we're ignoring the hollow thieves behind us. You can absolutely drop down, just kind of sneak out of that room, check your six. From time to time, they do aggro and chase you out of there, so just make sure you don't have one of them coming up behind you. They can backstab you, which may kill you, depending on how full your little life meter is. And we're going to take on our first puss of man. Oh my god, the puss of man. Worst name ever, most disgusting name ever, and but oh my god, these guys are fucking deadly. They flail and claw and bite and have deceptively long range, and they hit mighty hard. Luckily, fire bombs, man. These guys are susceptible to fire. They are both weak to fire, and if you hit them with a fire weapon or a fire bomb or something that does fire damage when they're not hyper-arming in their octopus flailing about, they will stagger. You can run up, get a couple free hits on them. Be careful, though. Be careful getting anywhere close to those guys, because they will just start swinging around wildly. They're kind of tough to track what they're doing or where to dodge. And if they hit you twice, you will die. A starting class character, any starting class character, regardless of vigor, if you're hit twice by those puzzle of man, you will die. I'm gonna grab some extra fire bombs as well. There's some regular ones here and some black ones. This is the rooftop de fire bombs. But we bothered to take out those pusses because they are a guaranteed drop for a titanite shard and an ember. The first time you kill them, they will 100% drop rate a shard and an ember. Both of those things are pretty very valuable as we were talking about prior. We got our second knight as well. Oh, that was an unfortunate move there, spear guy. I struggle with the spear versions more than I struggle with the Lothric knight sword versions. I think because of the great shield. I think because of the deflection. If I swing at somebody and I follow through with my swing, even if it's a 100% physical block shield, they don't take any damage, but my swing completes as normal, no problem. When you start bouncing off shit, that's when it puts a little hitch in your strategy. That's when you have to stop and reset and say like, wait, what? I just got staggered and oh, I just got thrust through the gut with a spear. Nice tight night shard for our troubles, for cleaning house. In this little atrium. I always forget about that guy on the ledge, too. I'll come in here and kill the hollow thief, and then that guy comes creeping over the ledge, and he'll usually pop up behind me and whack me at a less than opportune moment. 
And now, there is a broadsword behind us that we are totally going to let go as well. No thrusting attacks on that weapon, all slashy. Good point to point out, too. Over the course of this playthrough, we are only going to be picking up gear that is relevant to the build. We're not going to collect all the weapons. There's no completionist tendencies for grabbing all sorceries, not going out of the way for pyromancies. We're focusing only on snagging, thrusting weapons, as many as reasonable, and the miracles. Now, let's do some splodin'. Blew that guy up. Took a little dog with him, too. Down there on the bottom is another great opportunity to utilize those firebombs we've been collecting. Plenty of barrels that are probably filled with some sort of black powder that is highly combustible and will blow up in the most spectacular of way when hit with fire. It's a little tricky because you have to free aim your firebombs. Now, one little trick for free aiming I have picked up is to use an appropriate hairstyle. Our character, conveniently, has that ponytail smack dab in the middle of the back of his head. It almost acts as a faux reticle when trying to line up your throws. We've almost got a simulated target, a simulated crosshairs from the circumference of his skull. The little shape of his head is perfectly round and has that ponytail right in the middle. So if you line that up with whatever it is that you're trying to throw at that cannot be locked onto, chucking firebombs, chucking throwing knives, chucking whatever, it means that you're square. If you were to hold up on your stick, you would collide with your target. And then all you got to worry about is pitch, up and down. It's kind of difficult to explain, but if you go back and watch it and kind of just watch my head and watch that ponytail pointing at whatever it is that I'm throwing, it'll make a little bit more sense. Nice little trick. Pick that up in the original Dark Souls with the chignon which also works. We went down into that basement area to grab a cell key. We're gonna go make a friend. We're gonna go free an NPC in a little bit. Got an Estus shard for our troubles as well. And on the way out, grabbed a rapier for additional poking. We're totally ignoring the winged knight. He's just kind of on perpetual patrol around that center fountain area with all the headless bodies. He might be a little bit more trouble than he's worth. He does drop shards if you wanted to farm him. It's not a bad place to do it, but there's a much better farming location coming up here in just a second with those three Lotharic Knights. In the meantime, we're just going to grab some embers from around that central area and press on. We need to go now speak with Emma, the High Priestess of Lotharic Castle. She's going to give us a banner that will allow us to proceed if we go out onto the edge and let that thing flap in the breeze. We'll meet her a little bit later too. She's gonna give us a sob story about save my prince, save my prince. I got a couple different strategies for dealing with these guys. One, I always try and kite them. If you're totally MLG, you can run down there and take them 2v1, but they hit pretty hard and they swing in semi-unpredictable patterns. It can be a little bit challenging. I don't feel terribly confident that will end well, so I'm gonna do a one-on-one. -on -one. Hit them with a firebomb, hit them with a throwing knife, and just let them chase you back up, up to the to the stairs. If I'm actively engaged with them, like this guy, I try to stay a little bit aggressive versus being passive, waiting for them to swing and parry, because I find their swings to be pretty varied. Sometimes they come off immediately, sometimes they delay a little bit. If you can identify what they're doing and you feel confident in throwing out a parry, great. I got a partial there. Lucky me. But their initial approach, especially those sword guys, when they charge you, they'll usually do some sort of thrusting lunge or a quick swing. That's the best bet to attempt a parry. We'll talk to Emma as well. What's up, lady? Blah, 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 blah. Thanks for the banner. Sorry to be rude, but we are in a hurry. I think those knights are pretty cool, actually. Because I think they're a nice improvement on, like, the Silver Knights or the Black Knights or the Balder Knights from the original Dark Souls. Because you absolutely cannot just circle strafe them to cheese BS. They've got a whole lot of moves where they can turn around and swing quickly or swat you away with their shield. Just, hey, get out of there, buddy. Quit fishing for a BS general for play. I think that's a big improvement. The Dark Souls 3 backstab mechanics kind of fused what was going on in 1 and 2. In 1, it was an instant one-frame startup. In 2, you had this really long wind-up ramp-up to get into a backstab, and 3 seems to be somewhere in the middle. It's quick, but not instant. But I like the fact that you can't just lock onto somebody, hold left on your stick, and circle around and around and around and around until you get their back, and then just cheese them to death. We're gonna grab a Ring of Sacrifice 
from this ledge as well. We'll go out of our way to stockpile a couple of those because those are phenomenal little tools in these character building playthroughs. They're great for suicide runs. There's going to be a couple of instances down the way where we venture into remote areas where we probably shouldn't be. Maybe we're under leveled. Maybe the enemies are just really, really tough outclassing us, but we absolutely want some fill in the blank item. In those cases, we're going to throw on one of those Ring of Sacrifices, blaze through everything, ignore the enemies, grab whatever sparkly we came to grab, and if we don't survive it, hey, no sweat. We warp back to whatever bonfire we last rested at, all souls intact. Good lord. Stop it. Just stop it. But yeah, those Rings of Sacrifice let you keep all of your souls when you die. It's basically a free death, a free pass. We snagged our Lucerne as well, which I'm pretty excited about. It's not going to be our main, but we're definitely going to put that thing to work. It is a pole arm that deals exclusively thrusting damage, so that's going to benefit greatly from the Leo ring that we'll snag down the way and fits our build. In Dark Souls 2, the Lucerne was around, but it lost some of its special thrusty capabilities. In 1, it was great did all thrusting damage with the Leo Ring in Demon's Souls, even though it went by a different name. Fun fact, the Lucerne has appeared, kinda, in all Souls iterations. In Demon's Souls, it went by a different name. It was called the Murden Hammer. It actually did strike damage instead of thrusting damage, but I think for all intents and purposes, it was the Lucerne. And people hated that thing, man. Hated the Murden Hammer, those blessed Murden Hammers. They hated it so much that in a lot of cases, in a lot of honor duels, a lot of fight clubs, people would just ban it. Outright, they'd say no pole arms, no Murden hammers. It had a infinite stun lock, two hand R1 combo. And rather than deal with it, people will just say, nope, can't use it. But the Northern Regalia, Vitality Gouge is totally fine. As was the Blue Blood Sword. Two handed R1 infinite stun lock combo, probably glowing with light weapon. Ah, good times. Regardless, remember that crossbow guy? So this is where he would pop up and start pelting us with bolts. As we're trying to deal with those dogs, the dogs that are the absolute bitches of souls because they're so nimble and they will harass you and probably stagger you to get popped by larger enemies in the vicinity. Dark Souls 1 had a boss entirely built on that premise, the Capra Demon. But that crossbow guy that we killed at the very beginning is not around to cause us grief. We are taking out our second puss of man as well for the Ember and the Shard. This guy's a little trickier because you don't have quite as much room to get away from him. So I just went full on pyromaniac, just throwing firebombs as quickly as I could. He did pop us at the end, but luckily we had the life force to survive it. And that about completes our loop around the high wall. We unlocked a shortcut that put us very near back that first bonfire, the one you don't quite warp to. We grabbed some great upgrade materials. We grabbed a lot of weapons that are going to be relevant to the build. The Rapier, the Lucerne. We grabbed an Astora Straight Sword as well. I didn't talk to that at the time, but that is a nice weapon to just have lying around, upgraded. It does have some thrusting attacks, and we're going to raw that. Oh my god, the Astora Straight Sword is a little freak. So for some reason, inexplicably, when you raw that thing out, if it's upgraded, it has well over 300 AR. Very tiny stat investment for that thing. 10 and 10 strength and dex, and there's also a faith component to it. You need 12 faith to use it effectively. But my god, that is a beast little weapon, and nice to have, rawed and upgraded. We're on our way back to the second bonfire to make a friend. We're gonna save Grey Rat. Cool little NPC. We could have warped back to the second bonfire, but I figured, nah, with enemies cleared out, let's just run. Grey Rat, I like this cat a lot. Oh, wait a minute. Remember when we ignored those hollow thieves? Good God! Where the hell did that guy come from? I'm waiting for you under the stairs, Polly. Good Lord, puts the ass in Assassin. That guy came out of nowhere and just cleaned our clock. So we spawn, respawned everything anyway. That was just kind of unfortunate. That was a really nice run through the high wall. Until... We tried to go save Grey Rat. Maybe that means we shouldn't get him. No, we should absolutely get him. He becomes a merchant down in Firelink Shrine once you free him. And he goes off and upgrades his stock at a couple points during the game as well. He'll get better and better stuff. You know, to varying degrees of success. It's so funny. He says, hey, I'm thinking of pillaging the undead settlement. What do you think? Yeah, man, that sounds like a great idea. Hey, I'm thinking of pillaging Irithyll of the Boreal Valley. Should I go? Yeah, man. Go nuts. Hey, I'm thinking of pillaging Lothric Castle. 
Well, maybe you ought to rethink that a little bit. We'll talk about Grey Rat plenty as his story plays out. We gotta go save him first. What is this guy doing? I have never understood when you walk in there and he's facing the wall just swinging away, is he sharpening his blade? Waiting for an unkindled one to come around the corner so that he can spring on them like that guy did with us under the steps? I don't know. I don't know. Here's our boy. He's gonna give you some blah 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 about being trapped. He's gonna request that you venture into the undead settlement and check on a friend of his, Loretta. And he says, hey, she gave me this ring. Could you return it to her? I'll meet you back in Firelink. And I like that. I like that a lot. I like what that says about Grey Rat's character. He is a thief. He is a pillager. He may be a reaver, but he's got a heart of gold. Don't let them take it from you. And he's got this friend back in the undead settlement that he's concerned about her. He's worried about her safety. And he happens to have this ring that greatly increases defense when someone is in danger. And he says, hey, just drop this off. Please, he's a good dude. But back to the high wall. That's about all we need. All we have left to do is take out Vort of the Boreal Valley. Having respawned at that bonfire, I figured, yeah, we'll just run there. We'll take the slightly longer path. We could have warped back to the initial bonfire and taken the shortcut that we unlocked to get there a little bit quicker, but I don't want to deal with load times, and it's not that far of a run anyways. And Vort... Man, we gotta talk about Vort a little bit. I can't get past the name Vort. I think that is so hilarious. It sounds like a sound effect. It doesn't sound like the name of a threatening boss in a Souls game. Maybe appropriate because he's not that threatening. But doesn't he kind of sound like the sound it makes when you put on a new piece of gear? Especially a cloth piece of gear. Let me put on this Firekeeper robe. Vort! <laughs> or let me plop this giant hat atop my head. Vort! And story-wise, Vort is an outrider Knight. We'll meet a couple of them over the course of our adventure, and basically the Outrider Knights are Thrawns of Pontiff Sulevan. We'll meet him when we visit the Boreal Valley. Sulevan basically sends these guys out into the world to do his bidding. Sometimes they're doing general reconnaissance scouting, sometimes they're protecting things or preventing access to things in the case of Vort. Sometimes they're just out there hanging out, causing mischief and mayhem. There's old Vort. Rawr. And I think the Outrider Knights are pretty interesting. They have a de-evolution process happening within them that reminds me a lot of Hollowing. Whereas Hollows get uglier, more pruny faced, they lose their humanity, they lose their hair. Outrider Knights turn into beasts. Emma calls Vort a dog had we not skipped past all of her dialogue. We'll talk more about that and kind of that uh, recurring theme when we meet a couple more of these guys. But Vort, for the most part... I don't find him too challenging. I play unlocked and try to stay directly underneath him. Kind of manage your camera. It keeps you out of range of his attacks, which are all out in front of him. And then just kind of hack away at his back legs, hack away at his crotch. When he goes into full-on beast mode with his charges, I'll lock on. That makes it a little bit easier to dodge left and right. And at the end of those charges, he'll always go into a frost-based attack. Kind of an AoE fan. If you take a wide arc around him, you can get some free swipes at his legs, and with the power of our deep battle axe, not too challenging. We can advance. I always sit at this bonfire too, because it makes those doors pop open, so you don't have to wait for them to swing. As we head out this way, we get a big dramatic camera pullback, and we can raise our banner that we procured from Emma. Some familiar friends from Dark Souls 1 will transport us to the base of the high wall, and we can venture into the undead settlement. We'll pick up there in the next episode. But in the meantime, We'll open it up for feedback. Let me know what you think. What do you think of the new series? I think it was a decent start. Nice little run through the high wall there. Being efficient. Let me know what your thoughts are on miracles as well. Do they suck as bad as everybody says out in PvP? I'll find out for myself. But I'm always open to perspectives on things like that. And let me know about the run as well. What did I miss? What did I leave behind? What did I get wrong? What did you do differently? Hit me up. Always appreciated. My goal is to do new episodes with this thing every Tuesday. I want it to be a pretty regular running series, so I'll commit to that. With the exception of this one. Took me a couple tries to upload it and get a handle on the new YouTube closing screens. Fancy new features. So it's going to overlap with some DLC stuff, obviously. But every Tuesday, new episode of Clerical Lions. Until then, have fun. I'll see you soon.